Today we're on session seven of our Limitless series, and I want to share about how God healed a man named Naaman through the prophet Elisha. At first, it's really easy to read this story and to celebrate the physical healing that took place in Naaman's life, but today I want to challenge us to not miss the bigger picture. Yes, there was a physical healing that took place, but also there was true kingdom work taking place in this story. Um, Today we'll unpack how God is capable of healing our bodies, but how he's also capable of healing our hearts and our attitudes. So I want to tell you about how this has been true in my own life fairly recently. Um, apparently working with students means that you'll automatically spend half of your summer away from home. So I was at a teen camp um, not too long ago and I met a girl from a different church. Now, I do love all students, but this one particular girl, I have to confess in my humanness, I just really, really struggled with. And actually all week I found myself kind of dodging her because it felt like um, wherever she went, chaos was sure to ensue. And it was during the last evening service of camp that this girl went to the altar and she was praying and I immediately felt convicted in my spirit of my attitude towards her. So as I'm sitting there, I, I asked Jesus for forgiveness. I reconciled it with him, but I just kind of left it there because, you know, we were at the last night of camp um, and there wasn't really much I could do to pour into her life. Um, so I just, I just left it there. And then backtrack to the first day of camp, the director had us all write our names down on a piece of paper. Um, I didn't know why, but I did it and I gave it back. And so the very last morning of camp, we're standing in a circle and we're about to pray and leave for the week and she gets those pieces of paper papers out and she hands them back out to everyone and I look down and out of everyone in the camp whose name did I get yeah I got that girl's name and so the camp director challenged us she said I want you to take this piece of paper home and I want you to hang it up on your wall and I want you to pray for that person every single day until we meet again for camp next summer so I was not willing to be a good leader and to get past my attitude at camp that week. But I believe that God intentionally placed that name in front of me so that he could call me out of my attitude um, and past my pride and my feelings. So today my point is this, God is the ultimate healer. He can heal all things, but he can heal more than just our bodies. He can heal our attitudes and our minds as well. So we're going to be working through a good amount of scripture today. So if you're following with us, um, we're going to start in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1. And it says this, Naaman, the commander of the Aramean king's army, was respected and highly honored by his master. The Lord had given Aram a victory through Naaman. This man was a good soldier, but he had a skin disease. Now to help give us some context, I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to read to you what a man named David Roper said about this particular passage. He says, Naaman had honor, celebrity, and power, but he was a leper, all lesions and stumps, discolored, deformed, corrupted, shocking in his ugliness, a gross, grisly caricature of what a man is intended to be. Leprosy is one of the most appalling diseases known to humankind. It is treatable today, but in Naaman's day, it was terminal. And of all of the earth's diseases, leprosy is the only one singled out and linked with sin. It was a dirty disease that rendered its victims unclean, a word that suggests the opposite of holy. So the point is this, Naaman, he had all of the fame, he had all of the power, and he had all of the fortune, but he also had this life-threatening disease that was really just dehumanizing, and his social status couldn't cure him. So let's pick up with verse 2. It says this, Once when the Arameans went out on raids, they had brought back a little girl from Israel. She became the servant of Naaman's wife. The girl told her mistress, if only my master were with the prophet in Samaria, then the prophet could cure him of his skin disease. Skin disease. And skipping down to verse nine, it is clear that there was something in this girl's faith that compelled Naaman to um, take action. Because when we pick up in verse nine, he is right outside of Elisha's home. And verse nine says, Naaman came with his horses and chariot and stopped at the entrance to Elisha's home. Elisha sent a messenger to him. He said, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River and your skin will be healthy and clean. But Naaman became angry and he left. He said, I thought he would at least come out of this house, stand somewhere, call on the name of the Lord his God, 
wave his hand over the infected place and heal the skin disease. The Abana and the Farpar rivers in Damascus have better water than any of the rivers in Israel. Couldn't I wash in them and be clean? So he turned around and left in anger. So the word that Naaman used here for come out of this house tells us that he considered Elisha to be socially inferior to him, which means that Elisha felt that it was an obligation for Elisha to come out and greet Naaman outside of the house. Um, and that's where you really see his attitude problem at work here. Um, I think I would argue that this story is more about Naaman's attitude problem and his skin disease. God, through the prophet Elisha, is offering Naaman complete physical healing here. It was simple. He said, go wash yourself seven times and you'll be clean. But you see, that was the problem. It was simple. It wasn't extravagant. Um, the healing that was going to take place wasn't going to happen in the way that Naaman had hoped or expected. He was truly willing to sacrifice his own healing on the altar of his pride and his attitude. Have you ever been in that place where because God didn't show up for you or do something for you in the way that you had hoped or expected that you turned your back on him in anger? If you've been on this walk of faith for any amount of time, you know that sometimes God calls us to do the one thing that we really don't want to do. Like, Lord, I'm willing to go any place except for that one place. Or, Lord, I'm willing to love any person except for that one girl at church camp who just really gets on my nerves. And why do we think like this? God doesn't ask us to do anything out of punishment, but always out of love. The very key to walking in freedom is so often connected to the obedience in the areas of our lives where, where we are resisting God's spirit the most. Let's finish up that passage of scripture. If you're still following along with me, um, we'll pick back up with verse 13. It says, but Naaman's servants went to him and said, Master, if the prophet had asked you to do some extraordinary act, wouldn't you have done it? Why shouldn't you do as he said, wash and be clean? So he went to dip himself in the Jordan River seven times, and as the man of God had instructed him, his skin became healthy again like a little child's skin. Then he and all of his men returned to the man of God. Naaman stood in front of Elisha and said, Now I know that there's no God in the whole world except the God of Israel. Skipping to the second part of verse 17, it says, From now on I will sacrifice to the Lord alone. I will not offer any burnt offering or sacrifice to any other God. So Naaman is physically healed, and that is a miracle in and of itself, right? But let's not miss the true work of God in his life. Naaman experienced God, um, his attitude is changed, and his faith is established in the one true God. My prayer for you and for me is that we take time to see past our own pride, our own attitude, so that we don't miss the abundance that is walking in true freedom with Jesus Christ.